Happy soon to be Sabbath, everyone. Um, the song that I will be singing is called Unnumbered Grace. But before we sing, I would like to read you all something. And this is found in the Steps of Christ, page 35, paragraph 3. He is wooing by his tender love the hearts of his erring children. No earthly parent could by as patient, be as patient with the faults and the mistakes of his children as is God with those he seeks to save. I pray that you all have a rich blessing, receive a rich blessing from the song. thankful for the prayer and I'm thankful for that special music. We all need that grace to see us through and we need the grace this evening. This subject is, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, it's uh, difficult in that it's, it's so much greater than us, um, greater than me anyway. So we'll just get started on it. We're on the book of Reve Revelation, the time is at hand. Starting with the beginning of Revelation, there's, and we've talked about this before, it's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And it comes from Jesus. There's several things that Jesus wants us to know in the first chapter. One, he's the Son of Man. He is one of us. He speaks our language. 
He came and lived among us. I don't know if any of you sometimes pray like I do and pray to the Father. And, and there are things that you wonder if God actually understands. And you say, Jesus understands. He was here. He was here with us. And, and so he's the Son of Man. Another thing that Jesus wants us to know is that he's our high priest. He came here to this earth. He lived a life. He died to death. He resurrected, and then he went back to heaven as our high priest. And he's there ministering for us, interceding for us. At the very beginning of the book of Revelation, as, as we look at the rest of human history unfolding, these are two basic things we need to know. This is just as relevant for us in the 21st century as it was for them in the 1st century, that Jesus is one of us and that he's interceding for us in the heavenly sanctuary. And he's in the midst of the seven candlesticks, which we know represent the churches, the church of Christ. And this is what he begins with. The church of Christ is so important to him. Why? Because it's his bride. It's the one, the only object on earth on which he bestows his supreme regard. So his very first message, the very first message of Jesus to his church is to his church, to the church. And I don't want to go through all the seven churches. That's another talk. But I want to look at the last two because they deal with our present time. And there's a subject of doors that's involved with them that's uh, significant, I believe. Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So the last two churches say something about doors. The sixth church... The church in Philadelphia to the angel, John's told to write, These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. So Philadelphia can be called the church of the open door. But there's, there's more to it, because we're told that Jesus has the key of David, and he opens and shuts doors. So what is it talking about? Well, one place where it, it talks about open and closed doors is when Jesus came here on earth. He was here on earth, and then he went back to heaven, to the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, when he was here, and, and he lived and died for us, and then returned to heaven, a door was closed on earth. It was the door by which men had had access to God for the previous 1,500 years, the door of the earthly sanctuary. When Jesus went back to heaven, a door was open, the door of the heavenly sanctuary. A similar thing happened in 1844. A door was closed to the holy place. Jesus moved his ministry and his intercession to the most holy place. A door was open to the most holy place. Ellen White says it well in the book Great Controversy, while it was true that the door of hope and mercy by which men had for 1,800 years found access to God was closed, another door was open, and forgiveness of sins was offered to men through the intercession of Christ in the most holy place. One part of his ministration had closed, only to give place to another. There was still an open door to the heavenly sanctuary where Christ was ministering in the sinner's behalf. So there is an open door in heaven. And there's a closed door. And many of our Christian brothers and sisters don't understand that. And they're still worshiping at a place where the door's been closed. And there's an open door that, that we can all worship at. There's an open door in heaven. But there's a problem. And that is, there's still a closed door here on earth. And that's the next church. The church of Laodicea has a closed door. And that's the door of our heart. Jesus stands at that door and he knocks. He says, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. So the door in heaven is open, but the door of Laodicea is closed. Jesus longs to come in so that he can impart to us the gold tried in the fire so that we may be rich the white raiment that we may be clothed and that he may anoint our eyes with the heavenly eye salve 
that we may see. If we receive these gifts from the heavenly merchantmen, then we will be able to overcome as Jesus overcame. We'll be able to sit on his throne as he overcame and is sat down with his father in his throne. So at the beginning of Revelation, we have Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus. He is one of us, and he's in the heavenly sanctuary interceding in our behalf. And he has a message for his church. And the churches that are in our time, he has a message about doors. There's an open door in heaven, but there's a closed door here on earth. So John continues seeing, and the vision continues of the book of Revelation. He sees another door that's open. Revelation 4.1, he looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And lo, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. All right, so here's the office. And... Um, one of you may need to go and see Mrs. Clark. You'll go in her office. Now, you go in her office, you'll see a desk, and you'll see some chairs. You immediately know which chair not to sit in, right? You don't sit in the chair behind the desk. You sit in the chair in front of the desk. If she's not there, you sit in the chair where you're supposed to sit because that's her chair. And, and it, it's, it's a place that everybody recognizes that's where she sits. It's the same in Mrs. Rodriguez's office. The same in, uh, in uh, other offices that you'll see here in this building. There's a chair where the teacher sits and there's a chair where the student sits. Now, as you're there, the teacher, the person uh, sitting in the right chair, will speak to you. They'll, they may give you advice. They may give you counsel. And you respond in a certain way. You respond by listening respectfully. There, are, there may be things that they tell you that you need to do. Um, and it's important to do them because it has to do with your being successful here in school. So that throne is, the, the best word I can think of is authority. It, it, it has something to say that's going to help you and that's going to empower you. Uh, and you need to have the right response. So what's the right response? To listen respectfully. To, and not just respectfully, perhaps, but to listen responsibly. Uh, meaning that the things that you hear are things that you should seriously consider doing, not just listening, but also doing. And so the throne in heaven, there's a throne, and it's a throne of authority. There's one that sits on it. God sits on it. And we go before that throne, and there's an appropriate response. And that response is what we call worship. And so chapter 4 of Revelation is just full of this. It's got pictures that will, will bring out a worship response in us. And this is extremely important because worship is a central theme of the book of Revelation. Who do we worship? So you go through the book and you see these pictures. Uh, it's, it's so hard for an artist or, or anybody to really portray the, the picture, the vision that John saw in Revelation 4. These are heavenly things that we just can't describe. You, you have the throne, you have one sitting on the throne, and John says, and he looked like a jasper stone and a sidon. And there's this emerald rainbow around the throne. There are 24 thrones, and there's 24 elders sitting on them, and they have gold crowns. There are seven lamps of fire before the throne, and we're told that these are the seven spirits of God. And there are these four living creatures, and how else are you going to describe them? They're full of eyes within and without. They have six wings. They have the face of a lion, of a calf, of a man, and of a flying eagle. It's just this amazing scene of a throne and God on his throne, and our only response can be to worship. So what does it tell us about worship? First of all, it tells us who to worship, which is so important. We're told that the four living creatures with the six wings, with the eyes, day and night, they do not stop explaining, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. Revelation 4, 8. I'm trying to think of a way to explain this, this worship scene, and I want to call it intelligent praise. Because it tells you who God is and what he does. 
It's not gobbledygook. It's not random letters. It's not nonsense. It's specific words that have a specific meaning. Intelligent praise from the four living creatures. They tell us that God uh, is sovereign. He is the Lord God Almighty. They tell us that God is eternal. He's the God who was, who is, and who is to come. And they tell us that God is holy, holy, holy. This is the God we worship. And our response should be intelligent praise. After this follows um, the 24 elders who fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever. And this, does t this tells us something else about worship. The word worship in both the Hebrew and the Greek actually means to fall down, to bow down. And so that's, that's an appropriate response in worship. We know that sometimes we uh, can pray when we're walking or standing. We can talk to God all the time. But I think at least once a day, there should be a time when we kneel before God. It's an appropriate response, and it does something to us that is salvific, if that's the best word. It's healing. It's empowering. It's a blessing to us to kneel before our Maker. So they bow down, and they say, You are worthy, O Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So the next thing we learn about God is that he is our creator. Do you know that there are Christians who don't believe in creation? Do you know that there's Adventists who don't believe in creation? And there's, only, there's one question, one question that they need to ask themselves. Who are they worshiping? Who? They're not worshiping God the creator. He is our creator, and if we're going to have an intelligent worship, intelligent praise, we need to remember that he's sovereign, he is eternal, he is holy, 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 and he is our creator. So I thought of the word for the four living creatures of intelligent praise, and I was trying to think of a word for the 24 elders, how to describe their praise, their, or their worship, rather. And this is, this is the phrase that came to me. Reverential awe. Well, what does that mean? Help me out. What's reverential awe mean to you? Mercy. Mercy? Okay. Mercy. Right. In a certain way. Okay. What else? Reverential awe. Another definition. What? Amazing? Amazing. Um, Abasement. Okay, amazement. Yeah, amazed. Amazed. Real good. Yes, yes, you are. You are. Thank you. Help me with my hearing. Okay, what else? Submissive. Okay. That. Oh, submissive amazement. That's right. Okay, very good. Very good. Reverential awe. So several good definitions. Um, there is a place where we're taught about worship in the Bible that has always, it's, it has impressed me and struck me for many years. I keep looking at it to try to get some ideas on how to worship. And that's actually in the third temptation of Jesus. You know, Satan came to him and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, all these are yours if you fall down, bow down, and worship me. And we know the response of Jesus, which was, um, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now we know that Jesus was quoting, it is written, and he was actually quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Now there's several places. When you go to Deuteronomy and you look up where it talks about worship and it talks about serving, um, you're going to find many things. It's a theme that runs all through the book of Deuteronomy. Worshiping God. But the interesting thing is that uh, Deuteronomy 6.13 is the passage that perhaps most clearly sounds like what Jesus directly quoted from. And it says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, him only, that's the Septuagint, which the New Testament mostly quotes from. But notice 
that little change that Jesus put in. Jesus said, worship the Lord thy God. And in Deuteronomy, it says, fear the Lord thy God. And as you look at other verses in the book of Deuteronomy, you see the same thing. Fear the Lord your God. And it sounds like fearing the Lord our God is equivalent to worship. Does that sound right? It seems like it. Like fearing the Lord our God, the fear of the Lord. Those of you who read the Bible, which I know is all of you, you run into that expression over and over again, right? The fear of the Lord. And that sounds like worship because Jesus says, he quotes that passage, he says, worship the Lord your God and him only shall you, him only shalt thou serve. So, reverential awe, reverence, awe, respect is equivalent to the fear of the Lord? How do you feel about that? Okay, does that sound like it? Is, is, this, is that a good enough definition of the fear of the Lord? Reverence, awe, respect? Is there anything missing? Well, we're saying this is worship, right? So is there anything else that's missing? What? Okay, obedience. We're actually going to get to that. You're right. We're actually going to get to that. But there's something else I'm looking for. What? Humility. You get that impression, right, from reverence and awe and, and okay. Thank you. Love. Love. Look at this. The fear of the Lord. If you have love and you don't have reverence, awe, and respect for God, it's difficult to imagine that you're really loving God, but you don't have the fear of the Lord, right? Look at it the other way. If you have reverence, awe, and respect for God, and you don't have love for him, you don't have the fear of the Lord. That's the fear of the Lord. Something to think about. So when I was a kid, this is just, um, I pull photographs and slides out of, you know, just off the internet. But that reminds me of my Sabbath school class. I went to a church in Manhattan. I went to Spanish Manhattan in the 50s, 1950s. It was the mother of the Spanish churches of Manhattan. Uh, it was a good-sized church, about 300 members. And I enjoyed going to church. We went to church every Sabbath. There, I, I could probably count on one hand the times we missed. My mother was very, very uh, good about that. Um, and I enjoyed church. I enjoyed Sabbath school. I'd go down with all my friends. Uh, I would say, you see that kid there in the back raising his hand? That's probably me, except I sat in the front. Um, and, and I just, I would study because the minute they asked the question, I wanted to get the answer. I'd put my hand up, see if I could beat out all my other friends. Okay, that, I, I enjoyed church. And, and, and actually the sermon, I didn't think much about the sermon. You know, I was a little kid. I was around 10 years old at this time. Um, but I enjoyed church. Now, was that worship? Yeah, thank you. It, it is. Maybe not complete, immature, right? You're a kid. You're growing. So, but it's worship still. So what's the next step? What else do we need to think of in terms of worship? And somebody actually said it a little while ago. Looking back at Jesus' response to Satan, he said, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Obedience. Him only shall you serve. When you go to the book of Deuteronomy and you look up worship, actually, that'll be interesting. Look up the word worship in the book of Deuteronomy. The only time it's used, and I may be missing one, is in context of false gods. Whenever it talks about our response to the true God, it's fear the Lord and serve him. And then also it says to obey his commandments. That's part of the fear. That's appropriate worship response to the God of the universe. Um, when I finished, when Kathy and I actually were finishing our residency, uh, I had a friend who finished a little while after me. And uh, our friend was married, is married. Uh, this happened about 30 years ago, I think, right? 30 years ago. <laughs> She's not going to say. Um, and uh, he, he thought things through. 
And so his wife was an RN, registered nurse. She was working for a, an ophthalmologist. And he would operate from 5 in the morning to 10 in the morning, Monday through Friday. And she was his scrub nurse. She, she worked with him during his surgeries. So she worked from 5 in the morning to 10 in the morning, Monday through Friday. That's all she worked. And she made around $70,000 a year plus full benefits 30 years ago. So they decided, uh, we're just going to live on her salary. My friend just finished his uh, medicine residency, and he went to work in the emergency room. He was clearing 100000 a year. He banked it, didn't spend any of it. They drove a couple of old vehicles. They rented a house. Um, he banked his whole salary in 10 years. He had a million dollars. His wife retired, and uh, they started their family, and he kept working. When Kathy and I finished our residency, we had already decided before that we were going to work for the General Conference. We were going to go as missionaries. So we were on what's called deferred mission appointment. And so they had a place for us as soon as we, we finished. Uh, we actually we filled out this application uh, when you decide you want to be a missionary. And um, they asked you where you want to go. And we put wherever. They gave us three choices and said wherever. And they sent us to Puerto Rico, and I still I kept questioning the Lord because that's like a beautiful tropical island, and it doesn't seem like a mission field, but every place is a mission field. But we served there, and while we were there, we worked on one salary, and so I would work part uh, like two or three days a week, and Kathy would work two or three days a week. And then the, the time we were off, we were with the children. So I got equal time with our kids who were growing up, and Kathy got equal time with the kids who were growing up. And we were making probably less than my friend's wife was making during that time. But we were serving. It, it wasn't something we even had to think about. We were serving. You can serve anywhere. You can serve in a foreign field. You can serve here. But service is worship. Service is worship. You're preparing now to serve. Your preparation, I would say, can be worship. So, worship. What I want to leave with all of us this evening is that we worship the Lord. We worship him intelligently. We worship him as the sovereign Lord of the universe, and not just of the universe, but the sovereign Lord of our lives that we worship him as the eternal God. He's got a big picture in mind. He's, got, he's looking at the long view. Worship him as the eternal God. Worship him as the holy, holy, holy God. He says in the book of Leviticus, Be ye holy as I am holy. Worship him as the holy. Worship him as the creator God. The one who made everything and can also make a new heart in each of you, in each of us. Worship him as the creator God. And not only worship, but serve him. Serve him here in school and plan now when you leave here that you're going to serve him for the rest of your life. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, you are deserving of all worship, and we come to you with just a little bit that we have to offer, but we know that you dwell with him who is of a humble and a contrite heart, and just with our great need, we can come to you, and what, what little we have, we can come to you, and we know that you can bless it, and you can make it something really great and beautiful. So we pray as we come to you in worship that you will bless us, prepare us, every single person here. Help us to know you better, to know how to come before you in the appropriate way and to experience the life that you have for us as your creation. Bless each of us here. Bless us through this Sabbath. May our worship be acceptable to you. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.